All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Wu University event on a refresher on binocular vision with Dr. Valerie Lamb. So I am your host for this evening. My name is Dr. Ariel Serenzi and super excited to be with you guys. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Valerie Lamb. Uh, she practices at Insight Vision Center Optometry in Costa Mesa, California. She completed her pediatrics and vision therapy residency at the Southern California College of Optometry at Marshall B. Ketchum University. And she is passionate about helping treating binocular vision problems and helping patients love the way they see. Um, she also is famous on YouTube under the Insight Vision Optometry page. So make sure you check out all of her fun videos. I hear she has a really good one on um, the Brock string. So make sure to check it out. And we're so excited to have you. Thank you for being with us tonight, Dr. Valerie Lamb. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me on Wu University. I am excited to be here. Um, I have no financial disclosures. And let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, the reason that I put together this presentation is because um, I actually presented it um, at, at even one of our local society meetings. Um, I obviously tailored it, especially for you guys, but uh, the concept started because for the primary care OD, you know, you may not remember some of this binocular vision things since school or maybe haven't done a uh, visual efficiency, like accommodative flipper test, you know, but I wanted to make it practical for you. So, um, you know, here's some tips, um, you know, about treating binocular vision cases, but then also, you know, what kind of like things that you can do as a primary care optometrist when you see some of these binocular vision cases. And so let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick background about me. I'm on my nine year journey to still learning binocular vision. I still just at the bottom uh, you know, of the mountain. Uh, I uh, graduated SCO 2012 um, and uh, got a fellowship and that was really fun. But everything is just, you know, such a growth journey, right? Still at the base of the mountain, still feel like there's just so much to learn in the field of binocular vision. Um, so that's the exciting part, right? We graduated school and thought, hey, you know, we're going to be great and we're ready to go. And you realize, oh, there's just so much more that we don't know. And that's what makes the field of optometry so fun. So this is our mission statement here at Insight Vision Center. This is our office, uh, me and my classmate, Dr. Tan Mai. He spoke at another Wu University event, um, but we started this practice together back in 2015. And so this is our mission statement. We say it every day uh, when we start our day is we're here to give patients a lifetime of healthy vision so that they love the way they see. So from our part of the binocular vision department in the office, we help our patients love the way they see by getting rid of annoying double vision, taking away their headaches, improving eye-hand coordination, helping a child to read faster, improving depth perception, and eliminating amblyopia. So that's just some of the fun things that we get to do um, through vision therapy. Uh, and um, it's just, it makes your career just really rewarding because patients just really um, appreciate their vision so much more um, after working on it. So let's review. So I just wanted to introduce you to a couple cases, a couple uh, patients of ours. And so uh, these are real cases, but um, also through there to review some um, general binocular vision concepts. So uh, the first case is a review of non strabismic binocular vision disorders. So let's jump into it. I want to introduce you to Gunner. So Gunner was a seven-year-old boy referred for binocular testing because he wasn't achieving up to his full potential. Um, they labeled him as maybe lazy and working below his potential. Um, but mom brought him in, you know, saying, I think there's something more. Um, and he blinks his eyes constantly and he skips lines when he reads. So possibly maybe some double vision when he's reading, he couldn't quite describe it um, and does struggle with letter reversal. So, you know, a pretty typical case that, you know, they come in there, they're seeing 2020, right? So uh, very low refractive error, low hyperop, ocular health was fine, got some stereo. And uh, this was his binocular vision testing. A um, couple things to alert, you know, he had some virgins ranges. He was able to converge and diverge his eyes. Um, and uh, uh, he, we did the DEM, which is for those of you who don't remember, the developmental eye movement test is where you have to track a bunch of numbers. You have to go up and down and then you have to go left to right and you get scored based upon how quickly and how accurately you could track those numbers. 
so he did skip one line in that test. Um, and this was his accommodation, a little bit receded or low PRA um, when we did accommodative testing. So we did a, a visual information processing evaluation for Gunner. And if you can think back all the way back to optometry school days, if it's been a while since you've done this, this is things like the TVPS, the test of visual perceptual skills. You show them some you know, images, see if, if they can remember it. We test handwriting with the world sentence copy. We'll test their directions to see if they confuse letters. Obviously, that was a main concern for Gunner. Um, that's on the Jordan left-right reversal test. So we, I like to explain this to parents to say this is kind of like um, like similar tests that maybe a psychologist might run um, in the school um, if they were looking for any kind of visual processing uh, problems. So, you know, first impression, you know, you look at Gunner's profile, you look at his testing and it says, well, he's 20-20 on the eye chart, then they have perfect vision, right? Um, there's not much of a vision problem here. Um, no glasses needed, the RX is a little hyperopia and he's still 2020 uncorrected. So why does he need anything? Um, it's the school's job to help this kid with reading. Maybe he just needs a reading tutor, you know, let's see him back next year. Right? so I think in, you know, in, in a general, um, in a general snapshot, you know, it'd be easy to kind of just say, okay, you know, this child maybe has a little bit of difficulty, but you know, eye-wise he looks fine. Um, so, you know, really do we follow the numbers or do we follow the symptoms, right? And so when we look at Gutter's case, again, he got some binocular testing. He had stereo, right? So you're thinking, you know, maybe it looks okay. Um, you know, we look at the classic definition of convergence insufficiency according to the CITT study, right? So they had to ex have an exophoria at near, at least four prism diopters greater than at far, insufficient positive fusional convergence, so they can't do base out ranges very well, a receded NPC greater than six centimeters, right? So if you bring the, the fixation target and they break apart right out here, you're like, oh, convergence insufficiency, right? Um, or they take the CI um, symptom survey and they score high on that, right? Um, but interesting, so, you know, there's, there's been a, a discussion amongst um, the vision therapy doctors uh, recently, it was on the email thread, and it, it was just a really, um, well explained. Um, I don't know if you guys know Leonard Press, but you probably do. But he was making this uh, comment about could there be subclassifications of convergence insufficiency, right? So our classic convergence insufficiency we think is like the Dwayne's White classification following the CITT criteria that I just showed you. Um, but there are also these cases that you have this like non-classic convergence insufficiency type where there may be a basic exo, ortho, maybe they're even eso at near. Right, but they have unstable binocular vision with symptoms greater at near than distance. So, in the vision therapy world, we would say, yeah, that you know that does sound like convergence insufficiency. I know it doesn't follow the all the um, measurements of you know the Dwayne's White classification, um, but definitely seems like more struggle at near. Um, then you have kind of your developmental convergence insufficiency, right? So they may have seemingly normal binocular testing, however poor function at near than at distance on binocular testing. So just in general, you know, like there, um, you could tell that even if they score well on some of the tests, like it's, it's with much effort or you'll see them like wince, or, you know, they're doing the MBC and they just really shrink back and you're like, oh, you know, even if I pushed it to your nose and I got you there, like look at your face, their face was kind of telling it that um, it was very difficult or struggling for them. Um, so also, you know, there was another thing that was brought up in the book is called Optometric Management of Near Point Vision Disorders by um, Martin Birnbaum. Uh, and in this book, really, they are saying uh, that maybe even convergence insufficiency patients could even overconverge their eyes and manifest an ESO. So, you know, we used to think like convergence insufficiency, they're EXO, they're EXO, you know, large EXO at near, but um, not always necessarily, you know, and, and really you need to shift, kind of we need to shift our mindset to really think of it really just as like a near point stress. Um, issue, right? That these patients, um, when their binocular system is postured at near, and that makes sense, that's like reading, studying, computer, um, that their vision system is stressed. And, and then we see it manifest in things like blinking, rubbing their eyes, putting their head down, um, avoidance of activity, eyes getting tired, eye fatigue, headaches. So, you know, we're looking at these symptoms, symptomologies and saying, you know, really, um, patients very symptomatic, you know, in, in um, in a very much like a convergence insufficiency type of way. Um, so, you know, the way that we would see this patient, we would call them like kind of a basic skills case, right? So when I look back at Gunnar's findings, I feel, um, I, I felt like Gunnar had poor accommodative skills, 
right? So his PRA was low, a little bit receded, um, and um, conversions could be strengthened, even though he got up to 20 on a break point, his recovery was eight, right? So once he breaks double, he can't get it back to single very quickly, you know? So also um, kind of low divergence ranges, and you need that flexibility. Um, I was just reading an article that said actually virgin facility, like flexibility to go from convergence to divergence, um, is actually linked to reading ability. And so, uh, you know, definitely there's room for improvement in his tracking, you know, um, he did skip one line when he did the developmental eye movement test, and he still has confusions with letter reversals and confused on spatial orientation, like which way something should turn or, um, you know, what's forward, what's backwards, that confuses him a lot. Um, he definitely had poor visual motor integration and writing skills. When we did the Wold sentence copy, you can see an example of this down in the bottom right corner. He's to copy this sentence verbatim. He can look at it, it's not covered up, right? Not from memory. He copies it on the line below. This is how many letters he got down in a minute, right? So definitely um, some, you know, difficulties writing with him, motor and visual motor integration, mom says hand writes really sloppy. So um, just want to show you a video because uh, we had a lot of fun with him, working with him. Uh, so this is a fun video of him doing a vision therapy exercise. You couldn't quite hear what we were describing, but he was tracking letters on the chart. So we're working on a saccadic eye movement type of activity, integrating some vestibular, right? So having him rock from left to right, trying to integrate his body. Um, and then when he gets better and faster, you know, we'd like to add in an auditory processing component by having him do it to the sound of the beat or to a metronome, you know, obviously pushing him for speed and accuracy. Um, that's one example of a vision therapy exercise we'll do to try to help Gunnar improve in his reading. All right, so here's just some other examples of some fun activities we did. Um, of course, you all remember the heart chart, and you know, that still exists. We still use it. It's great. Uh, we did Brock string exercises for convergence training. Um, we did some um, directionality training of which way things should face. Uh, and so this is an example. Gunnar did was a COVID patient, meaning that uh, he made it all the way with our office through COVID on Zoom. So this is an example of him doing Zoom therapy with one of our therapists here. Um, and uh, that was just a fun season in life, wasn't it? So all vision therapy became virtual and we became very creative with that. So um, here was his ending results in after post therapy. Um, but um, you can just see just like some really great scores about, you know, this is how strong his eyes and his vision system is now. Base in and base out ranges are just uh, like double what they were before. Just really great, um, great convergence diversion skills. Um, his DEM, his uh, his tracking skills up to ratio up to 85 percentile, which is uh, very fast and much more accurate tracking now. Um, his accommodation got much stronger. Um, if we take a look at his perceptual um, training too, like he's not as making as many reversal errors now. His original score was 57 percentile. Now he's in the 75th percentile. So that just means like that concept was more solidified for him now, right? He's not getting confused. He's not um, flipping letters back and forth. Um, I think what's really cool too is if you can see like his bold sentence copy, he can actually write a good amount of the sentence now within a minute. So that's definitely going to help him in school to be able to keep up faster, to be able to um, to write, you know, all that he needs to do. And so, um, yeah, so this is, you know, just one really example of, you know, looking at the patient and looking at their symptoms, um, his blinking stops, he's not skipping lines when he's reading, no more double vision, his letter reversals are gone. Uh, I can't read the last one because the Zoom bar is covering it, but you can read the last bullet right there. 
Okay, so how does this pertain to you? So as a primary care optometrist, if you don't do vision therapy in your office, you know, what can you do? What can you do when you see a patient like this and you want to be able to give them a little bit of help um, and you suspect, hey, you know, actually there may be a component to their visual system. Um, low plus reading glasses can be very helpful for these patients. Um, developmental optometrists prescribe anywhere from maybe 0.25 to 0.75 low plus. Sometimes they prescribe maybe like one to half base in um, or even yoked prism, like half base down, one base down. Um, we call those developmental lenses because they're not really for clarity, they're really for performance, right? And so same thing, you know, Gunnar didn't need it um, for clarity, but he really needed it for performance. That giving him this pair of glasses helps him to read, you know, longer without getting tired faster immediately. That was very helpful. Um, it's just one tool that we can use. Another thing um, is uh, you can do uh, ocular motor testing, you know, so your basic pursuits and saccades. Um, and just take a look for quality of eye movements and quality of um, how their eyes are able to follow the target. You know, so let's say you're doing your EOM and you move the target and you see that their eyes are jumping all over the place. Th their tracking is probably poor. They're probably skipping lines when they're reading. You know, so if you can pick up on that, um, that would be very helpful to the parents because a lot of times you might be the first doctor to kind of catch it or to make a mention of it that could be really helpful for these patients. Same thing as checking MPC near point of convergence. Don't just look at the number, but look at a qualitative assessment. Watch the patient, watch how they react, watch how their face is when you bring the target close to them and see if they win, see if they talk about things that, you know, they, a lot of times they may not complain of double because they don't know how to verbalize it. They thought, doesn't everybody, doesn't it just look like this to everybody? Um, but they may also describe it as blur or like words coming in and out of focus when they read, um, they kind of like move around. Those are some pretty common symptoms that they might describe it as. Um, and then also, you know, to take a step back, you know, you do the annual exam, you probably see a lot of pediatrics in your office to say, you know, how, how's the child doing in school? How are they doing in reading? You know, look for any signs of near point stress. Um, this is what we do, what we do. You know, I mean, uh, we don't ask for it, but it's always just, it just makes it, so um, worth it when your patients just say, hey, you know, my child's doing really great. Thanks for all that you've done. Um, that's, I think that's why we got into vision therapy is because we wanted to help patients in something more than what we could do just through primary care. And it's great. I get to work with them longer. I love it. Get to see them every week. So let's go to our next case. So let's talk about a review of refractive amblyopia. So I want to introduce you to Beckett. So Beckett was a seven-year-old boy who comes in for an eye exam due to blurry vision. So he's prescribed glasses from another optometrist, but he didn't really like to wear them. His habitual RX was a plus 425 in the right eye and a plano in the left. So your pretty classic case of a nice amotropic amblyopia, right? So um, when I did a manifest refraction on him, he's got a plus four in the right eye, plus 50 in the left. We cycloplege him, he's a plus 550 in the right eye, plus 150 in the left. Ocular health is fine. He gets a tiny bit of stereo, 500 seconds of RDS. Um, very shallow, suppre shallow suppression with worth four dots, okay? That's like, yay, exciting, because he sees red and green light. And you're like, yes, there's sensory fusion in there, right? He's a little bit of um, esophoria in there on his cover test. So first impression, right? Patient has an a nice metropic amblyopia. Great. Let's just cycle him, prescribe the full amniso, just like we were taught in school. Try to get him to wear a contact lens in the right eye, right? That's like too much plus, so that'll be really thick in the glasses. And let's patch two hours a day or use atrophy. You know, so this is um, this is how I first thought to treat amblyopia coming out of school. And um, I wouldn't, I don't think that a lot of people would disagree with this. You know, I think that it is a definitely in the uh, could be an effective way to treat amblyopia. Maybe not, in my opinion, the most effective, but it probably will get, you know, acuity uh, somewhat better. Um, you know, you look at the amblyogenic refractive errors, you know, you remember this from the AOA, you know, you have your um, isoamotropia values, um, you have your anisometropia values, anything for hyperopia, more than one diopter of anisometropia can cause amblyopia. So here's where we have a paradigm shift. Right. So this is coming from, you know, I went from the bottom of the mountain to now maybe a two steps up the mountain where I learned a little bit more than what I learned from school, which is, hey, you know, there's actually kind of a new approach to treating amblyopia now. So amblyopia is actually a binocular problem, not a monocular one. This was groundbreaking. 
So when I first learned this, I was like, huh, it changes the entire way that you think of treating amblyopia. Because, you know, when we used to think of amblyopia, we think, you know, work the right eye, patch it, make the right eye work harder, do fine acuity type of things like, you know, crossword puzzles and coloring in the little holes of the O's, right? Every time you see that in the newspaper and like doing really just like drilling fine acuity type of activities for the amblyopic eye, trying to make that vision clear. And so once we take a step back and said, you know, we need to be looking at amblyopia from a binocular standpoint, um, the improvement that we see in amblyopia is much faster and much longer lasting. So this was huge, 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 huge when I learned this. So um, a couple other articles, if you want to take a look at it, read this article by Dr. Sanit, of course, very, very um, pioneer in the field. Um, he also works with this doctor called Pilar Vergara, um, and she is in Spain, and she's been using kind of this new strategy of treatment. They actually just did a lecture on it at the past COVD this past year about just new treatment strategies for amblyopia and um, ways that we should be approaching it instead. So this is a really great way to understand amblyopia. Um, and so if you have, uh, you know, the left side of the picture here, you have two brothers, right? And the way that you want to think of it is you have the shy brother who hangs out in the back corner. And then you have the loud brother, the one who's like, hey, mom, hey, mom, look at me, look at me, look what I can do. Mom, mom, did you see this? Mom, look, look, look at me. You know, like, like, check me out, right? So mom is like the brain right? And the two brothers are like the eye. And so the eye without amblyopia is like your loud brother, taking all the attention. So as soon as mom walks into the room, the loud brother takes over and mom just pays attention to him, right? The quiet brother never gets to talk, right? And the quiet brother gets overshadowed by this loud brother. So the whole goal in amblyopia treatment, right, is to quiet down the loud brother and bring up the soft or the quiet brother, so they can both talk at an equal level and mom will listen to both kids. If you have two kids, if you have kids at home, I have two girls, you know, it's all about trying to be fair. You know, you want to be equal to both children. And so uh, this is a happy, this is a happy, you know, happy family when mom can talk to each brother um, equally. Same thing in amblyopia when the brain can talk to each eye equally. So think about that next time you have an, a case of amblyopia in your chair. So let's take a closer look, right? So what can we do for Beckett here? So by changing the Rx, the patient can now be, um, you decrease the right eye to a plus three, right? So remember cycle was a plus 550, right? But we're going to a plus three and that gets into 2025 in that eye. Left eye, we're gonna push plus. I don't care if the left eye is a tiny bit blurry. Actually, that is one of the strategies for prescribing for amblyopia is you don't want it to be super sharp. Remember, we're trying to calm down the really dominant brother, right? And we're, uh, we're trying to let the more shy or passive brother speak up. So if you have too much discrepancy in your acuity, right, the brain's always going to default to the clear eye. So even if you can prescribe like sometimes we talk about like a barely blur contact, like over plus that eye by a little bit, just to get it maybe one line of acuity or two lines of acuity more blurry. So that now the acuity in the dominant eye or in the left eye for Beckett um, is more equal to the acuity in the right eye. Now he has a better chance to be binocular. And when you do this, he gets 30 seconds of stereo. He went from 500 seconds of stereo to 30 seconds of stereo. So uh, a lot of treating for an isometropic amblyopia is really prescribing the right prescription that promotes better binocularity and increases their depth perception, right? And um, this was hard to swallow, but I believe it now, is actually prescribing full aniso is like punishing the amblyopic eye. You do not have to prescribe the full aniso. Typically, patients tend to feel more comfortable um, and they get better binocularity if you don't. So now everyone's talking about functional testing, right? Is that like to find kind of that, that sweet spot, that happy ending of where you're going to prescribe is really the prescription that gives them kind of the best binocularity. Um, and so that might even be a stereo test. You know, you have them put on stereo glasses, they're looking at a stereo test and you might be trial framing a couple prescriptions. And the one that they say, oh, that one's easier to tell that that's your winner. So I've actually done that in the room before. Um, let's take a quick look at the review of the literature. Um, a lazy eye is not really a lazy eye at all, right? So they actually say that, uh, you know, in amblyopia, it's really an active process due to suppression, right? So 
you know, we used to think like maybe all oh, the pathway is, you know, underdeveloped. It's actually because it's being suppressed. Um, so if you can think about amblyopia, treating amblyopia really like trying to break suppression, um, you, you get better results. Okay, so also, right, we always talk about, um, we want, we don't want it to come back, right? Once they stop treatment, uh, we want the acuity and the gains in stereo that the patient has achieved, we want it to stay, right? And so that is why I tell parents, I say, look, you know, patching used to be the way that we treat amblyopia, um, but patching actually creates more recurrence or more regression after you stop the patching. And why is that? because patching is treating amblyopia as a monocular condition, right? So you put the patch on, you make the amblyopic eye work and practice, and you know, you take the patch off, it goes right back to, the brain goes right back to suppressing that eye. So you're not breaking down the suppression, you're not addressing the suppression um, if you're doing just like a monocular treatment, um, like a patching type of treatment. Um, so here, again, just to say it again, patching creates a monocular, not a binocular environment. Um, let's say you you don't have you don't have any kind of other equipment and maybe parent or patient this is the only thing that they can do. Um, I'd like to encourage you to consider a um, opaque patch. Okay, so you can see some of these pictures here. This girl's wearing like a little film over her glasses. The other girl's wearing like a pirate patch, but it has like a white transparent look instead of like the black pirate patch. Um, black pirate patch makes it a truly monocular environment. If you give them an opaque patch, at least they're binocular. So one really, really important uh, kind of category of activities that we do for amblyopia is what we call MSBS, stands for a monocular fixation in a binocular field. It's all about encouraging um, the amblyopic eye to work more or to you know, not suppress, but in a binocular field, meaning with both eyes open at the same time. So at least if you put some kind of frosted patch over the eye, both eyes are staying on, but they are focusing more out of the amblyopic eye. So um, just consider that or think about that. Um, even something simple, right? Um, I, I think I have it in the next slide, but I just use like clear contact paper sometimes and just use a circle hole punch and just give patients, you know, a baggie full of 50 of them and say, here, you know, you can even just use this, you know, and um, go away from kind of like those Band-Aid type of patches now. Okay, so what you should do is you should treat amblyopia as a binocular problem. You'll get better results with less regression. Okay, and think of your goals of your treatment for amblyopia is really to break suppression and to ensure equal performance or as equal as possible between the right eye and the left eye. And again, always trying to improve for binocularity and eye teaming, right? Because really what's the goal, right? Is the patients walking around every day, they're not walking around squinting one eye, right? They're really walking around in a binocular um, status, right? With both eyes open. So if you can maximize their function and how their binocular system is working um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, they will perform better, they'll read better, they'll drive better. Um, so it'll be more functional for them in life. Okay, um, I'm giving you permission, but don't be afraid to cut the NISO if it gives them better binocularity and they feel more comfortable. Um, you can prescribe active therapy to help train the eyes to team better. You know, that's always helpful. Um, I think it goes a lot faster and it tends to be more fun, more effective and more compliant um, than just doing passion at home. And if inclusion is the only option here, where I showed you just like clear contact paper. This is the simplest thing, right? Anybody can get it. You can get it at your nearest Walmart. Um, but that would be my encouragement to you to prescribe some kind of opaque patch instead of some kind of patch that blocks out the light. Um, this is a great time that I'd just like to take a quick mention. I know that our um, uh, our, our presentation is being supported by AmblioPlay. Um, AmblioPlay is like one of the great softwares that we use. I have uh, no financial interest in them. Uh, I just found them and I was like, this is a great program. This is super fun. So they have all these kind of like computer games um, where you can use the mouse, you can click on targets, you know, it makes it like a uh, video game style because of course these are kids and we need a way to make it fun and interesting for them. Um, but it's all anti-suppression, you know, so they come with glasses. Um, the cancellation is great, but mostly the graphics are awesome and the kids love it. And so anything that you can do to make training fun, anything you can do to make it interactive and to encourage the eyes to be binocular is going to be a really effective treatment for these cases. Okay, great. So you met patient number two. Let's jump into patient number three. So let's review esotropia. Esotropia used to be so scary. You know, you, you, you're a student and you're like, ah, the eye crosses in. What do I do? What do I do? Right. And so um, now, you know, even, even amongst binocular vision doctors, I feel like we all feel 
like we've arrived some when we finally understand esoterms. Um, they are their own classification of patients. And so let me introduce you to Bray. So Bray was a five-year-old girl. She was referred for strip business in amblyopia from a neighboring optometrist. Um, she's clumsy, she falls a lot, bumps into things and hates reading. So this was her acuity. She has 2200 in the right eye, tw oh, sorry, 2020 in the right eye, 2200 in the left. Um, and here was her manifest refraction. So obviously she's got a, uh, some anisometropia going on with her hyperopic prescription, um, but she's also got an esotropia, right? So she has both, um, both things going on. And um, we did, let's see, I did change her prescription a little bit. I tried putting an add on for her to see if we can get some, some just additional plus in there to help her with alignment. She saw absolutely no stereo, completely suppressed the left eye on the first four dots. So she was a 14 constant left esotropia at distance, a 16 constant left esotrope at near. Um, another interesting thing um, that you will see common in your business is uh, the eccentric fixation. So just to remind you what that is, uh, remember that if you look with one eye and you're supposed to look at the center of the target, you can do this with like a direct ophthalmoscope. Um, and uh, they have, there's a little bullseye target in there. And you're gonna ask them to look at the target and see what part of the fovea they use to fixate, right? And in eccentric fixation, they're using an off foveal point to look at whatever they're looking at. And so uh, we've, we've, uh, uh, we've treated a good amount of patients that have eccentric fixation. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because, you know, for them, their, their eye is kind of like wandering around or drifting, you know, so like even when they're reading the acuity chart, they're not sitting there looking at the letters, they're moving their head constantly. And you're like, what's going on, you know, and so a lot of times with these patients with strabismus, they actually have very poor fixation of that eye, they don't actually even know really where to point the eye um, when it's trying to look at something. So uh, no NPC, I couldn't get an NPC because she suppressed the entire time, no versions ranges. So first impression, right, is, um, so Bray looks like a partially accommodated esotrope. She has strabismic amblyopia and the left eye suppresses. Okay, so what would you do? So again, you know, as we learn to treat these conditions better, you know, do we um, take road one? We treat the amblyopia first, then we tackle the strabismus. Maybe we're gonna start with, you know, monocular activities. We're gonna start to try to improve the acuity. Maybe that 2200 is too blurry, right? Um, other school of thought, uh, row two is we treat the strabismus first, then we tackle the amblyopia. You know, which one, which one should come first? So here's my slide again, a paradigm shift, right? So when we were taught how to approach a case like this, my first understanding was I should take row one. I should treat the amblyopia first. I should try to make the acuity as, as you know, strong as possible. And then when the eye can see better, put the eyes together and start binocular training, right? But really, um, here's the paradigm shift is, if you do the amblyopia first, right? Maybe like intense patching, you're gonna try to do that and then train the esotropia later, you will get better monocular acuity, but you may turn them into an alternator actually. And that may cause them to have diplopia or they may have really deep depression that they just switch between using right eye or left eye. The newer approach really that we're encouraged to take is to treat the strabismus first. You're gonna to try to make the patient more binocular and then improvements in acuity follows. And it's amazing, right? It's, um, it, it, it seems so counterintuitive because you would say, really, you know, like how can they even try to be binocular? There's 2200 in that left eye. Um, but actually taking this newer approach um, promotes more lasting results. It reduces binocular competition, right? And the binocular vision will be really more useful for them, right? What's our ultimate goal? Is our ultimate goal is not that we want them to get the best score on the visual acuity chart when they come in for their eye exam. Our ultimate goal is we want them to have the most functional vision, right? And so ultimately what's going to be more functional for them? Having better acuity and being an alternator? or having some kind of binocular vision, even if the acuity in the left eye is not as clear. Um, ultimately, we believe that that's more comfortable for them and more functional for them. So I also want you to, again, take a step back and think of this patient as having strabismus from head to toe, not just in the eye. So if we, um, have you ever heard this to take a look at the posture of your patient when they're sitting in your exam chair? 
um, binocular vision docs uh, laugh about this all the time. But you walk into the exam room, you don't even need to say the patient's name. You look down at their feet and their feet, their toes are pointed in. And lo and behold, they're like an isophore, right? So they say that looking at the body posture will give you such a clue about what their eye posture is. And so, um, you know, even before jumping into cover testing, even if you can take a look at, you know, what their kind of like their, their stance is, what their posture is, you know, their shoulders, even like their balance, like some binocular vision doctors will even like put scales underneath their two feet, because if they put more weight on one foot than the other, you can tell that their center of balance is not in the middle, right? That will manifest in the eyes. So if you, um, I wanted to show this. I saw this picture and I just thought, oh my gosh, this is the best picture of pigeon toed, right? So if you have an isotrope and you see them pigeon toed, think of these awesome shoes. Okay, so if we go into the background history of Bray, right, we actually find out that the patient was born with torticollis and she had a very weak left side ever since she was young. She underwent heavy physical therapy to gain strength on that side. Um, and it even took her a very long time to learn how to walk and to be able to shift her weight from the left side to her right side, a skill we call bilateral integration, going from left to right, integrating the left side and the right sides of our body, right? And she um, also underwent like chiropractic just to try to straighten her neck out. So if you think about that, you know, this is her history of when she was born as a baby, right? Now we see it just manifested all the way throughout the entire body, including in the eyes, right? So it just kind of puts together the pieces a lot better, right? And saying, you know, when I see her in the chair, she, her head doesn't look turned, she looks straight. So we actually really would not not have known any of this background history until we did a deeper dive of her medical history. So we did do vision therapy with this patient. We had a lot of fun with her. She was one of my favorites to work with, although I say that about every patient, so they're kind of all my favorites. But looking for strabismus throughout their body is very helpful for improving alignment, right? So don't address monocular training first in cases of strabismus amblyopia, right? You want to look for any place where they can be binocular. So I want to show you this diagram here at the bottom. Do you see how there's two eyes? In this picture of this diagram, it's the left eye that's crossed in, right? The blue square is the centration point, like, or sorry, the blue square is their point of fixation where they should be looking. But do you see the intersection of where the line of sight is? It's like off to the, um, off to the top right. I think I can even annotate maybe right here, right there. Okay, so that is what we call the centration point. Okay, it's huge, huge, huge to look for in isotropes. And it's the point in space at which they get some level of binocularity. And if they can have a centration point, you have good prognosis for improvement, right? So how do we test for this? I have a slide on that. Okay, so um, I'll go over to that when we get to your take home points. But um, when we test for centration point, we'll do something like the worth four dot and we'll bring it closer and closer and closer to their nose until they can finally see all four dots. And that at that point, we know this is the nearest point at which both of their eyes can actually be binocular. So post-therapy, we did 30 sessions with Bray. Again, remember she's five, so, and she also has uh, some attention issues. So she was a bundle of energy, um, but um, acuity improved, which is great, brought it down to about 2080 in that eye which is awesome. Um, but on stereo, you know, she didn't get uh, RDS, but she got worth four dots, um, all four dots at distance and near. So that's huge. That means that we are getting some kind of binocular vision at distance and at near. Um, she's still with an isotrope. So I used to think that I failed as a vision therapy doctor if I couldn't get every strabismic patient straight. And I used to think that that was my gold standard of treatment. And um, now having seen so many patients, now you realize um, that that's, that's not a realistic um, cure, really. And that's not realistic endpoint, um, both for yourself and for the patient, really. Um, really, our end goal is better binocular function, right? Um, as much uh, as much function as we can, as much binocularity as we can, as much stereopsis as we can, because we know that that's going to be a better vision system when they end therapy. So in this patient here, she ended up as a six constant left isotrope at distance and a 10 constant left isotrope at near so far, right? But she has versions ranges now. And you're like, how can she get versions ranges? Well, remember, she has some level of fusion now. Um, and her tracking improved. 
So remember, we're looking about function, not just measurements, right? Because measurements satisfy us doctors, but function satisfies the patient. The patient hated reading, and now her tracking skills are up to the 85th percentile. So that's great. You know, mom's saying she's not clumsy as much anymore. She's not bumping into things. She's reading so much better now. And so that, I mean, that's really, that's the cure, right? That, that's our goal and for these patients is by helping eye alignment, by helping binocular functioning, it's helping their overall performance. So review of the literature, um, esotropia is, you know, commonly infantile or develops slowly, uh, shortly after birth, right? Um, but it's really an anomaly of fusion is the suspected cause, right? So their eyes, at some point want to be binocular, but it's in this very crossed in position, right? So the idea is if you can get their eyes straighter, but still that their vision system understands, oh, I'm still being binocular, you can get um, improvements in alignment, improvements in acuity, um, just by helping the vision posture to be um, close, more, as close as possible to ortho, right? And so uh, I think this is really, just so key when you're treating esotropia because you know you see these huge 20 diopter esotropes and you think, oh my gosh, that's that's so hard to fix. And then when you see it from a sensory perspective, like no, there is room for improvement in their sensory system, they can straighten their eye out. Um, and they can straighten it out to a, a you know very close to ortho, and that's great. They just avoided surgery. Okay, so what should you do? So if you're a primary care optometrist, you don't do vision therapy in your office, here are some things that you can do to help these types of patients. Um, so you can consider a near plus to help with better alignment, right? So that might be reading or computer glasses. Um, that might even be, you know, let's say that they don't have high hyperopia and they don't have any amblyopia, but you get some esophoric or esotropic posture. Um, you can prescribe them reading glasses or computer glasses. You know, just giving them some plus to help straighten out the alignment of their eyes will make them um, much more comfortable, um, less eye strain, less headaches. Um, I prescribed this before. I prescribed multifocal soft contact lenses for young, you know, like 15 year olds, 20 year olds that have either esotropia or an esophoric posture. Um, and it really just helps them to feel. Uh, you know, like less eye strain and fatigue on the computer. And you know, secretly as their eye doctor, that they're, when their eyes in better alignment when they're doing near work, um, that is absolutely um, much less fatiguing. It's going to help them to feel and have much better vision. Bifocals. So I used to put bifocals on this slide and then I put sometimes. So you, we used to always think prescribe a bifocal for accommodative esotropes, right? And um, yes, absolutely it works. Um, but I will also kind of throw the devil's advocate in there too, that actually some, pay, some doctors are feeling like maybe actually a bifocal is um, more hindering uh, their ability to really have like a more fluid or more flexible binocular system because you're pretty much teaching them not to accommodate, right? Um, but in esotropic patients, their problem is once they accommodate, their, you know, their eye jumps way in, right? So if we could teach them to accommodate, but maybe less, right? Instead of just completely taking out their accommodative system by giving them a plus three ad, you know, that actually may be a more functional or a more um, better solution. So I put that there because I think, I think prescribing bifocals for esotropes is not 100% commonplace anymore. You know, that um, a lot of binocular vision doctors are kind of going away from that or trying other things. I um, also want to encourage you to look for deeper, um, look deeper for other associated etiologies. So remember in the case of Bray, right, she had the torticollis that she was born with. She had already an asymmetry in her body that she was born with. And so if you can look to those type of cases, even doing like PT, doing some kind of like bilateral integration motor work, sometimes doing that alone improves the eye posture a lot. Um, we will do that in vision therapy, that we will do some motor training. We will do some gross motor body coordination activities in a lot of our strabismic patients. And doing that alone helps the alignment because it's really, you know, going to the root cause, which is in the center of the body. Um, vestibular training, very helpful. So in esotropes, actually, um, there is a good like battery of exercises that we may spin them in a chair using that rotation um, to help to improve the alignment and the movement of that eye. Um, another technique is using what we call like a VOR drum. You might remember it. It looks like a, like a little cylinder and has a bunch of black and white bars and you spin it. And just using that 
motion to get the eye to tick can actually improve the flexibility or the range of motion of an isotropic eye. Um, another thing that I will mention, um, wasn't taught in school, but it's something called binasal occlusion. Um, it's being talked about a lot in the binocular vision world as a very effective tool to, um, to be used for isotropia. So it's in this picture right here on bottom corner with these glasses. And it's a tiny bit of tape that you put right here on the nasal portion of the glasses. Um, there is a you know, method, a, a, a method of how to prescribe it. You can't just put any kind of tape on there. It has to be at a certain angle and a certain width um, to get the right response. Um, but my nasal occlusion, a very effective tool in helping to treat some of these isotropic patients. Okay, so once you refer, right? So a lot of times, you know, you see a patient with esotropia or you have a friend who has a little baby and their eyes crossing in. It's like, ah, who do we refer to? Do we refer to vision therapy? Do we refer them to surgery? You know, when to make the right call too. Um, so when to refer to vision therapy, you know, really if there is any indication of them having sensory fusion, meaning that they can use right eye and left eye at the same time. Remember we talked about that centration point, right? That is a great prognosis that vision therapy can be very effective for them. Um, here's another thing that we thought was bad was having anomalous retinal correspondence, right? Like, ah, oh no, they have ARC, right? But actually now um, in strabismic patients, anomalous retinal correspondence is actually very helpful. So we actually use that as part of our training. Um, there are few vision therapy doctors that want to maybe break the anomalous retinal correspondence and try to transfer them to normal retinal correspondence. It is a very risky way to do it, although it has been successful in some cases. So some docs who do it, you know, kudos to you because um, I, I have heard it be successful. But um, in most cases, I think um, the general kind of population of vision therapy doctors are using that anomalous retinal correspondence and using it like letting them be anomalous um, because uh, anomalous retinal correspondence is actually some form of fusion, right? And uh, as a goal is we want them to have some kind of sensory fusion, even if it's not foveal to foveal, but they're, but they're fusing, hey, that's, um, that's a more functional binocular system. So if they have suppression, but there's some zone of fusion, um, again, a good, good prognosis for vision therapy. Um, I put the slide up here, this little white circle. That's just like something that we do. It's called luster. We look for luster. It means that they're looking at a very blank screen and you put red green glasses on them and you just see if they can see the colors mix, right? They don't have to be aligned. They could be strabismic, but if they can see a little bit of red and a little bit of green, that's a great sign for us that they have um, potential or they have sensory fusion in their system and it's great potential. Um, I have seen a patient that was isotropic, had a surgery as a baby. And when we did that test, she saw red, green, red, green. It always alternated. It never went on top of each other. Um, and, I, and I told her, I was like, I think you might have that horophysionis where it will just never merge on top of each other. Like it will keep um, between her right eye and her left eye. She'll never be able to sync those images up. So really not a good case for vision therapy then, you know, and so... Um, we just, I told her, I was like, I think that your binocular system is, is a coping like this, and we should leave it like that. <laughs> when to refer to surgery? This is a great question too, you know? So in surgery, um, they really, uh, they reposition the muscle, you know? And so, um, I know that, uh, a, a lot of ophthalmologists are really pushing for, you know, under age two, because they want, they, they say under age two, there is maybe a higher chance of them getting some kind of sensory fusion after strabismic surgery. Um, also patients that just want a cosmetic here, they don't want to do the work. They don't want to, they don't, you know, they just want something fast. They want to fix it now. Um, surgery might be kind of, you know, the more option that they're looking for. Um, angle of deviation too large. I put a question mark because really remember, like I said before, it's the sensory status of the patient. It's really not the angle of deviation. So it's not that a necessarily a 25 prism diopter isotrope is necessarily harder to treat than a 15 diopter isotrope. It really depends on their sensory system. Okay, so we got a few more minutes. I want to grab into our last case. So let's talk about review of binocular vision after sclerals, right? So this is a patient, patient number four, Gilbert, who came to us. He's a 43 year old Hispanic male who's diagnosed with keratoconus 10 years ago, struggling with distorted vision, right? He's tried RGPs in the past, but he struggles with the comfort of them. And so we do a lot of um, specialty contacts at our office. And so my partner's really, um, really kind of the master of fitting scleral lenses, um, well-renowned in the area. And so we um, help the fitness patient in scleral lenses. 
Um, prior to sclerolysis, it's about a 15 constant less isotrope at distance and near. Um, but again, it's approximate because he's got poor fixation, right? Because he's 2200 in that eye. So again, how can he really have a very clean cover test? Um, so great success with scleral fitting. Now he's 2020. Awesome. Fantastic. He can see, right? So um, now he's at 25 constant less isotrope at distance, though, and a 20 constant less isotrope at near. So his eye goes way in, but he can see clear. So now we fix one thing, and now we have to fix the, the strip business now. So his complaint is he now gets double vision at distance. Reading on the computer is very difficult. He sees shadows behind objects. So why did his isotropia not bother him before? Because he was 2200 in that eye, he probably just suppressed it, right? And so, or it was so blurry, really there's no fusion, there's no potential for fusion there, right? So it doesn't actually matter where the eye is postured because he's really just kind of performing as a monocular uh, vision system. So we tried first, we RXed him just plain old glasses because his scleral lenses prescription's fantastic um, with two base out prism in the distance and gave him a plus 250 at it near, right? To try to help him on the computer screen. Um, and he got stereo. He got 32 seconds of stereo through the ad. Okay, so again, we looked for his centration point of where he was able to get binocular vision, right? And this is what I was talking about. So you just use the word for a dot. You probably all have it in your office. And you just bring it right closer and closer, closer up to their nose until they can actually see all four dots. So it's funny because you put it at, you know, 40 centimeters and they'll say, you know, I only see red, right? It's complete suppression. But if you bring it closer and closer, there is a point where they'll actually see red angry. And that's really exciting. So going through Gilbert, our goal was really to expand the range of his centration point, right? So we did say, hey, can we try vision therapy on this patient? Because you know, he hasn't used both eyes together in a really long time. And so, um, but it showed that he had stereo. So he had some form, he, he did have, you know, depth perception at some point in his life, probably prior to the onset of the keratoconus, right? So through therapy, it was really great. He was able to extend his centration point from eight centimeters from his nose all the way to 60 inches. That's giving him a desk a desk space that is not diplopic, that's giving him almost a room space that is not diplopic without any glasses on. Um, so that was great, you know, and it was just, again, just using his sensory system, using his binocular system again. So here, um, I'll just go through this here that there was an article that talked about anomalies of binocular functions in patients with longstanding keratoconus, right? There were 20 patients in this study here, um, but really, um, there were, with no contact lenses on, 19 of, out of 20 of them were strabismic, right? Um, mostly extratropia, extratropia, right? And then with scleral lenses on, 60% were strabismic still, 70% had some measurable stereo, although very gross, like 200 seconds or worse. 30% of them had no binocular function at all. So really, what should you do? You know, some of you docs out there, you may fit specialty contact lenses. Um, you know, Dr. Wu invited us. I know Dr. Wu is just a, an expert in fitting like specialty contact lenses and scleral lenses. So just a plug from your binocular vision doctor uh, uh, colleagues here, just, just check a recheck of cover tests and stereo after successful scleral lens fitting, just to check their binocular system, right? You could do maybe some prism glasses or reading glasses over it to help them. Um, and expect that, you know, we're assuming that they were binocular prior to the onset of keratoconus. So expect that binocular vision can be restored. So if it isn't, then we should push to try to restore their binocular system because they, they probably have it in there. Okay. All right. So a couple of take home points just to wrap this up. I want you to remember from learning from patient number one to look beyond 2020 to the patient as a whole and how the vision system is contributing to their overall performance. Patient number two, this is our amblyopic patient, just see amblyopia as a binocular problem, not a monocular one. Take on point number three from our third case for esotropia is remember strabismus occurs head to toe. Consider the etiology when determining the appropriate treatment. And take on point number four, don't forget about binocular function once you restore QV and keratoconus patients with contact lenses. So I wanna say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share my patience with you. Thank you for listening to Binocular Vision. I hope that you find it interesting, but I hope also that you find it important. You know, we're such a big proponent and believer that restoring binocular function and having just a really strong vision system will improve quality of life and improve um, patients' ability to perform well in school and in their jobs. 